Can you all see my title screen? Yes. yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So thanks again, Sam, for uh, for the introduction. Um, yeah. Shooting for a cause. How to make photo how to make photographs bigger than just you. Um, I'll touch on that here in a moment. Um, I just want to say just a formal hello and uh, just want to say that I'm, you know, I'm Nate Hofer. Um, again, thank you for having me. It is an honor to get to be here again, chatting uh, with a Newton, Kansas audience and, and hopefully beyond out, outside of Newton as well. Um, I'm super excited to talk about my photography work um, from a body of work called One and a Half Acres and what that's all about and how that is connected to a cause or issue in the world bigger than just one person. Um, this, this presentation is an adaptation created for a talk I gave at the Kaufman Museum last fall. Uh, so this version will be similar, but a, a little more focus on what I've learned in the process of this, of this journey, uh, uh, what I've learned about attaching myself to, again, work or my work to a, a cause greater than just myself. Um, a little bit about me and my background. Uh, I learned a little bit about my heritage. Uh, my, and uh, <laughs> born in 1974, um, you know, Hofer is, is, a, uh, is a very sort of Freeman area, South Dakota name. Um, interestingly, both my, I, I, I have both on my mom's side and my dad's side uh, have uh, Mennonite uh, tradition, but slightly different. Um, but, uh, so, so that's a little bit about me. It, um, you know, my career and, and, and day job is in graphic design and branding. So I'm not a professional photographer. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a family guy. Um, I've got a couple of kids. I'm a university of Kansas alum, uh, graphic designer, artist, uh, letterpress printmaker on occasion, musician, and of course, constantly curious and constantly, uh, creatively driven. Uh, it's important to say here, I think, who I'm not. I'm not an expert on nuclear weapons. I'm not a Cold War historian. I'm not a political or foreign policy wonk, wonk in any way. I'm not even an academic and maybe not even a real photographer, uh, but we can talk about that here. Um, yeah, a Kansas boy most of my life with a short stint living in, in Missouri, in Kansas City, not too far away. I'm coming to you right now from Overland Park, Kansas, so not all that far away. Um, and I grew up in this area, um, around Lawrence and Eudora, Kansas. And, and I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, I have some connections to Newton. Um, and, and so of course getting to pr present it to this Newton community is super meaningful to me, um, because of these connections, you know, um, I've, my, my great, my, my grandparents, uh, were Jake and Lola Friesen, um, yep, North Newton, um, my uncle Bob is is, is Bob Regeer and and Aunt Fernet. Um, and and of course we've got family there in 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 family and friends in Newton. Uh, and my sister and I have been coming and visiting, you know, a family there since the seventies. Um, and we and we still return and and find reasons to come. Uh, a, a quick acknowledgement that worrying about um, the dangers of nuclear weapons is a privilege. You know, many communities that are not my own face daily more pressing existential concerns. So um, in this era of social responsibility, I think that's something to point out. So now you know a little bit about me. Um, so how did this all start? Uh, you know, how did I start making photographs of decommissioned nuclear missile silos in the Midwest? Um, it, I, it, it, if, if you know my work at all, that's great. If not, that's great too. Um, I'm going to take you all through it here uh, in a few moments. Uh, so believe it or not, uh, we need to talk a little bit about where I was born because that is important. Um, I think it really did all start um, here. Uh, my parents, right out of Bethel College, were part of the Teachers Abroad program, uh, and they spent three years in Kaduna, Nigeria as conscientious objectors to the Vietnam War. Um, that's where I was born. Um, I was only there for three months, uh, so I really know nothing about Nigeria. Um, or I have no remembered experience of it. Um, but, you know, conscientious objectors to the Vietnam War. That's, that's quite a legacy to live up to. So throughout my life, I've always known my parents to be war protesters. 
Uh, and then growing up in and around Eudora and Lawrence, Kansas in the early 80s, you didn't not know about some aspect of the Cold War, you know, Russia, the Soviet Union, the communists and potential dangers of nuclear weapons. It was just in the air. Um, for example, we lived within sight of Sunflower Army Ammunition Plant, and we all knew people's moms and dads that worked there. And it seemed to be accepted that if World War III started, we'd be a target of Soviet ICBMs. Another example uh, is the filming of the TV movie The Day After, filmed in and around Lawrence, Kansas. We all, know, we all knew people who had been extras in the movie. Uh, and when it aired on TV in 1983, my mom didn't allow me to watch it. Uh, a TV movie, you know, not even an HBO cable movie, which made me understand uh, what a big deal uh, this issue must be around nuclear war, nuclear weapons. And oddly enough, I still haven't seen it. So no real good reason around that. Um, but I did understand, you know, as a key, yeah, I did understand, you know, uh, some of the issues as a kid. And I had a lot of anxiety and existential dread at that time. And I didn't really know what to do with that. Um, however, time moved on the day after eventually motivated President Ronald Reagan to talk with Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev on agreeing to disarmament talks of some nuclear weapons. You know, something that's kind of hard to imagine today, I think. Some nuclear weapon limits were put into place. Um, the Berlin Wall came down, the Soviet Union and the Cold War ended and life moved on for me. So fast forward now um, into my, well into my adult years, into my 40s even. Uh, in 2016, things are not going the right way, it seems to me. Um, the, childhood, the childhood anxieties come back. Fire and fury tweets become U.S. foreign policy. Decades old nuclear agreements with Russia come to an end. A pivotal new nuclear agreement with Iran is left behind. China is building hundreds of new nuclear missile silos in the Gobi Desert. North Korea continues to expand its nuclear program. Russia rattles its nuclear saber in its unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Um, but now as an adult, I have a way to deal with, with my anxiety and existential dread. So, so, that's what, so that brings me to the work here. So one, what is this? Um, in a short sentence, it's a celebration of our past nuclear weapons. It's a celebration of our past nuclear weapons disarmament. Um, this is a visualization of America's former nuclear ICBM sites and how they look today, 30 years after the Cold War. Because I think right now we need to be reminded how and why this happened. Today, we face multiple existential crises. It's overwhelming and depressing, but perhaps there's hope because we've been here before. And these images are from those success stories. We're simultaneously looking forwards and backwards here. Uh, so when I think about uh, getting to the theme of our, this, this discussion, then, you know, so when I think about attaching um, work that I make to a larger cause, this is, this is what I think I mean. Uh, the personal lesson I've learned is that I can make this work completely auto autobiographical, and that's fine, and keep it somewhat smaller scale, or I can set my work into a context of an ongoing cause that I care deeply about then that helps me talk about it and helps me write about it, which helps me understand more what I'm doing. Um, the autobiographical aspect is still there and gives me some credibility to do the work. But if I change my focus to a bigger cause beyond me, nuclear nonproliferation in my case, then I think there's greater attention given to that cause because now it affects more people. It, it has the potential to, to touch more people and, and maybe be generally more relevant. Um, so this photo uh, is, is a self-portrait of me at the Minuteman Missile National Historic Site in South Dakota, just to the east of the Badlands and is run by the National Park Service. And I highly recommend it if you're ever in that area. Uh, and Newton, Kansas is an excellent place for me to, to frame this work, I think. Um, Perhaps some of you saw my work, uh, and it's fine if you did not, at the Robert Regeer Gallery on Bethel campus back in September. Uh, I was there for uh, four weeks 
And again, very meaningful to me because my great uncle, um, Bob Regeer, Robert Regeer is the namesake for the gallery. Um, and, uh, and, and so this is why I'm presenting today, you know, uh, actually Marianne Eichelberger saw my artist talk at the Kaufman museum and then invited me to get in touch with Sam here at the library. So, uh, just wanting to make a connection there. Uh, and, and it was really that, uh, that, that time in Newton during the exhibit, um, when I became aware of North Newton's own past history of war protest and nuclear non-proliferation during the Cold War of the 1980s. Uh, there in the museum at the exhibit at that time, there was a shirt that uh, belonged to a Bethel student um, who, who oddly was uh, my Spanish teacher at Eudora High back in the early 90s um, and who I connect, reconnected with a little bit. And he gave me some background on the student efforts uh, to make North Newton a nuclear free zone. Uh, both symbolically and, and practically. Uh, for, so what I was told was that this meant that, like, for example, the military was not supposed to transport nuclear weapons components through the rail hub in North Newton. Um, and another part of that, that time, um, uh, another part of North Newton's nuclear protest legacy uh, there at Bethel uh, were a group of students who organized and rode their bikes to a few of the Titan II ICBM sites active at that time, 1981, around McConnell Air Force Base in Wichita. There was a ring of about, I think, 18 of those. Uh, still learning about those, uh, but it's impressive to me. Uh, these photos cur or courtesy of David Kreider and Chuck Regeer uh, of the Kaufman Museum. And so knowing um, that there is gonna be a connection to with my work to Newton, um, and knowing at that time that I'd be exhibiting uh, at Bethel, uh, I made a photograph of one of those decommissioned sites uh, today. Um, all, all of those sites have, be, have been decommissioned since 1987 due to technical obsolescence, not because of a treaty or an agreement. Um, but this one on screen here is a, a former Titan II site uh, just outside of Winfield, Kansas. Um, you can see that you know, there's, there's a vague vent fence line around the border, um, a lot of overgrowth, and then, uh, you know, some cement slabs. So I, we should probably talk just a little bit about what an ICBM weapon is, um, you know, and how they came to define the Cold War, just a little bit here, uh, just to help place this work into context. I uh, just want to check with everybody since I can't see everyone. Is this it is uh can you guys hear me? Can everyone hear me okay? Oh yeah, it's good. Okay. Good. Right. Okay, good. I seem to be okay as well. So great, great, thanks. Uh so okay, so the ICBMs. Um so these weapons were part and parcel to the Cold War. Uh NATO versus the Warsaw Pact from 1947 to 1991. Uh the supply has been decreased since the end of the Cold War, but there's but there's plenty more ICBMs uh, since then that are still active as we speak. These weapons defined the concept of mutually assured destruction, a concept that still exists today between NATO and Russia, North Korea, China, Iran, because nuclear weapons are so dangerous as to end civilization as we know it. These weapons are designed to destroy cities, full stop. Uh, and to this day, no nuclear weapons have been used since the end of World War II, but they continue to be deployed. And there have been plenty of accidents and close calls along the way. So uh, to my mind, I, I feel like we're very lucky uh, to have avoided a, a major catastrophe. Uh, yeah, did the war, did the Cold War really end in terms of nuclear arms? I, you know, I'll let war historians uh, decide that. Um, and then just to be specific, we're talking about land-based nuclear weapons for, for the work we're about to look at, um, as opposed to the nukes on, our, on submarines and bombers, um, because those are the ones most consequential to us, the land-based uh, missile silos, because those are the sites that surround our communities, uh, the ones that are visible to us on an everyday basis, if we're, um, if, at least for the people who live around them. And that would be uh, potential targets in the event of a nuclear exchange. So where are these targets? 
Uh, so looking at open source data on Google Earth for where uh, these are, we can, well, well, there's three stages. There's kind of like three main chapters of ICBM nuclear missile history. And uh, the first one are Atlas silos uh, from 1959 to 1968, 350 of those were deployed. Um, they, they took hours to prep to launch. They were fueled with liquid fuel, which was dangerous to deal with. And a large crew of personnel um, was needed to continually maintain these. Um, and to launch, they had to be hoisted up on an elevator above ground, which would have been vulnerable to an attack. And eventually, you know, decommissioned due to technical obsolescence. So you get kind of an idea here. Um, it's not very readable, but you got you see that you know there's some you know north of us in Nebraska and, and several places in Kansas, um, and, and in the north, northwest, west in California, some in the south, and in the northeast. So that's Atlas. Then Titan ICBMs. They came shortly after. 54 of these were deployed all the way until the 1980s. Way bigger nuclear yield, way more accurate. A shorter prep time and can be launched straight out of the ground. They still use liquid fuel. Um, so that still meant that meant that they still took a large crew of, uh, to continually maintain these weapons. And, and then again, decommissioned due to technical obsolescence. And if we just take a dive into Kansas here and see where these uh, Atlas and missile site and Atlas and Titan missile sites are. The red in the, at the top are where the uh, Atlas sites were. And then the green uh, sites at the bottom is where um, the Titan missile sites were. And, and so you can see how they kind of make a ring around Wichita there around McConnell Air Force Base. And the, the photo I showed you just a moment ago um, was in was in Winfield, and I think that would have been down or in somewhere in the south uh, east corner of that ring. Not exactly sure which one, maybe six or seven. Uh, okay, so yeah, that was Atlas and Titan. So then Minuteman came next. Um, shortly after the end. Shortly after the start of the other two ICB programs, uh, the Minuteman program uh, had been developing, uh, and this eventually led to 1,000 deployed missile sites during the Cold War. And this was in addition to the, the total of Atlas and Titan. So those actually overlapped. Um, Atlas came and went fairly quickly, but then Atlas and, and then Minuteman and Titan were, were, on, were kind of uh, coincided. So there's over 1,000 ICBMs uh, buried in our landscape um, during that time of history. Um, and the um, Minuteman ICBMs, I kind of think of as the Henry Ford ca cars of ICBMs. They, um, you know, we were able to crank them out like sausages um, for these six missile wings that we see here on the map. Um, didn't use liquid fuel anymore. Now it's solid rocket fuel, which makes um, way less maintenance, easy, easier to take care of, also less crew and then just minutes of prep time to launch. Uh, and they can be put in much smaller plots of land. You can put them into a farmer's field with, with no continual maintenance or crew living there. Uh, less nuclear yield than a Titan, but way more can be made. Um, yeah, a smaller footprint in the ground, about one and a half to two acres. Uh, and there, and, and it's it should be noted that there are still currently about 450 of of these original Minuteman um, missiles still on alert at this time. So where are those? Um, so a, a more a little bit more than half have been decommissioned since the end of the Cold War, of the, of the original thousand I was talking about a moment ago. Everywhere we see a white X is our, a missile field that's been completely decommissioned. Um, so it's just, you know, it's interesting to me is that, that, this, that this ever happened. You know, it's hard to imagine today um, countries agreeing to sign treaties and decrease the amounts of their nuclear weapons. Um, but this did happen, you know, at the, at the end of the Cold War. Uh, the two superpowers at that time did make progress toward a nuclear free world or at least a world with less nuclear weapons. 
So if we take, we'll just take a deep dive into that down there. We see in Missouri, the white X, we're going to get in close there and we're just going to see what the, what the makeup is of, uh, of a nuclear missile field. So this is the 351st missile wing, all decommissioned. Um, just in between Kansas City and Columbia, Missouri. So we can see right above, you, you can see Kansas City right above the word wing in the top left corner. And then Columbia, Missouri is over on the top right corner, if you can make that out. Um, so you get kind of an idea of like just how, how spread out, how dispersed a missile field um, is or was. So a missile field is typically 150 Minuteman missiles, that's three squadrons of 50 missiles each. And then each squadron was five flights of 10 missiles. So this gives us kind of a, a broad overview of how it was organized. If we move into just one of those flights, um, that breaks down to, to 10 missiles uh, being controlled by one launch bunker um, that we see here in the middle. Just gave my thumbs up to my to my son. He's gonna he's gonna jump online with some friends. Um, so, and that and so when we see this kind of the spider here, we, the 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 hub right there is is the launch bunker. That's where personnel would be, um, you know, sitting in the ground with the two keys, you know, twenty four or seven at any given time, waiting for an order to come through to to launch their ten missiles. Uh, and so there's a ring around the hub. Each of those circles um, is highlighting one missile site. Uh, and so each of those are spread out just far enough that uh, a Soviet missile couldn't take out more than one of those. So there's a strategic reason why those are placed as far apart as they are. And each of those decommissioned missile Minuteman II missiles at that time uh, were equal to uh, 100 kilotons nuclear yield. And, and by comparison, you know, thinking of the Hiroshima bomb was 15 kilotons. Uh, so today, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs would be considered something more like a, a, a low yield um, bomb compared to modern weapons today. Uh, again, the photo of me making a photograph of the, of the preserved decommissioned Minuteman missile in South Dakota. Uh, each of the existing 450 Minuteman three sites today that are still active, we're talking more closer to th something like 333 kilotons. And there's more coming. After 60 years of the Minuteman ICBM program, um, it will be phased out uh, in favor of a new program of ICBMs called Sentinel. So keep an eye out for that in the news. Uh, it was only named last year, and um, they're working on putting it into place now, getting the infrastructure ready for it. How's everybody doing? Good. Okay, <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah, uh, so I'll, unless there's any questions right now, I'll, I'll just keep on trucking. What did they do with the, the missiles that were decommissioned? That's a good question. So what I've what I've heard is that the the missiles came out of the ground first. Uh, the warheads were taken off, and the warheads were disassembled or destroyed somewhere, um, taken taken apart, so that in a way that that wasn't they weren't able to use them. I, I'm not sure what what the new where the nuclear components went after that. Okay. Yeah, so good question. These are all public. These are all public record locations that you absolutely that, that, that somebody else found, or did you track all these down? No, good question. I did not track these down. This is uh, this is all public information, and here in a bit, I'll sh I'll show you how to find that yourself if you're interested. So we'll talk about decommissioning decommissioning next. So in the 1990s, uh, hundreds of Minuteman silos were destroyed under the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, the START Missile um, Treaty. So I, I found an old photo here um, online, a Reuters photos from 2001, that shows how these were decommissioned and that 
they used dynamite to implode the silo. Once the, the missile was taken out, it would be it would be blown up from within, and then uh, and and then and then, and so I'll, actually I'll just go to the next slide and, and talk about this. Um, so more open source satellite imagery on Google Earth. So as a part of that START missile treaty between America and the Soviet Union, uh, the crater that you see there here, uh, the missile site is this rectangular fence line. And the crater you see here is that explosion where it was blown up or imploded. Um, of course, after the nuke was taken out of the ground and destroyed. Uh, and what's interesting here is that this was left this way for some months so that Soviet satellites could fly over it and see into it to confirm its destruction. Uh, so 1996 is what is, if you go to Google Earth, you can see the same image. Um, wait, and I love this irony, you know, it's a peace treaty to destroyed this nuclear missile silo and more like it. Um, here's, I, so here's where I start to geek out. You, you know, this public information you can go through and you can see the same site over the years. There's a satellite image. Uh, here's one from 2003. Um, you can start to see that the site is, is completely decommissioned. The fence line is still there. It's starting to overgrow a bit. 2004 looks about the same. 2005, possibly overgrowing a little more. 2006 looks like this could be in the, in the wind, maybe the fall or the winter. 2007 looks like there's not a lot happening there. 2009, perhaps the fence is gone. There's some different kind of landscaping going on here. Not sure. 2010, it looks like it's even the fence is, is for sure completely gone here and starting to kind of just melt back into the. Uh, it's, it's surrounding farmland there. Then 2012, apparently satellite imagery gets a lot better. Um, so you, you, know, you can see uh, these, these power lines. If you look over on the far right of the image, there's two power poles that are left. And there's kind of a ghost image just to the left of those power poles. Of You can see that same rectangular shape, which just amazes me. Um, you can see the entrance to the... Looks like they're building another lane of the highway here. And there's a, you can still see the entrance, the access road. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and that's all that's left. 2014 looks about the same, but now it's maybe the growing season. So that this kind of public information is something that really interests and, and inspires me and was the spark for, 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 the, for this work. Um, so let's take a look at, at the work now. So these are photographs I've made. Um, and so hopefully you kind of, you're sort of oriented a little bit to what you're looking at here. You know, this is three decades after um, these sites have, be, have been decommissioned. Uh, each site looks a little different, but in many cases that original security fence from the 1960s is still there. And the current landowner, most of the time a farmer um, is using, putting that to use somehow. Um, so in both of these, we see hay bales on the south side in the, in the south kind of part of that, that fenced area. Uh, and then on the, the site on the, at the left, it looks like there's a, maybe a, a place for cows, like a feed yard there, a feed lot. Uh, and I, I always try to point out where these are too. Um, so there's a little, you can see the town listed in the, in the corners. So on the left, uh, Lima four is in Holden, Missouri. And then Lima seven on the right is in Blairstown, Missouri. And I think that's always interesting to point that out because it's important to know where the front lines of the Cold War was fought, you know, in, in our midst here in, in uh, Kansas and Missouri. Uh, and, then, and then here's a couple more. Malta Bend, Missouri on the left and Oscar 10 in Knob Noster, Missouri. Uh, on the left, it looks like to me that just like, farming implements. And then on the right, Oscar 10, uh, I spoke with this owner. There's, he has a, he bases his business there, uh, like a, uh, an earth moving business. So he knows what it was, presumably. So this owner is 
was especially interesting because he knew exactly what it was. In fact, he calls his his LLC is titled Oscar 10 to the to this at this very moment, because that's because mm-hmm. uh, just paying tribute to what this site used to be. Um, and he grew up in this area. So he he was a little bit like me. He was he was aware of what was going even more aware, way more aware than I was of what was going on, because he saw the Air Force missile trucks, you know, going down the road, carrying carrying the, the missiles to and from the sites. And he would see the maintenance crews regularly uh, and participated in the fallout drills uh, in his high school. Back in the 90s, early 90s. Uh, a couple more, Center of View, Missouri, and uh, Nelson, Missouri. Who's, who owns that property? Oh, which, which one? Well, uh, where the missile site used to be. Now, oh, so, now. Yeah, so that's a great point. So, so each of these missile sites are, are in private, are, are owned by private uh, individuals. Uh, in a lot of times it goes, the land went back to the, um, the original owner, but it's kind of interesting. It's, that's not always the case. Uh, the, the government military took this, this land through, um, uh, and it was eminent domain I'm yeah. lo- losing my, my, my words. Yeah. It's, um, at the, in the sixties. So it really wasn't up to the the landowner, you know, didn't have any, any say in that really. They, they got, they were given a fee, um, more symbolic than anything at the, at the time that it was that, that they gave that land over. And then at the, at the end of the cold war, they came back around and offered it to the, the whoever owned the surrounding land. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and an offering to, to, to have it sold back um, for about the same price. Um, so in so in most of these cases, uh, the 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 landowner who the, the owner who owns the surrounding land got to um, reclaim that that property, but not always. The one on the left here was was is one of those not always. Uh, the surrounding land is is owned by one person, uh, and then the the property the missile site itself is owned by somebody else. Uh, it, you know, some of these are, are active farms today, you know, there's literally farm, farm implements there. Uh, so the one, so each of these of course have, have grain storage all in Missouri. Yeah. And then sometimes that they, they, there'll be a fence running through them, um, like spanning two properties, uh, on the right side in Boonville, Missouri, I, I talked to the owner of the of the north side of this property. So the south side uh, is a farm. So you see that the hay bales there, uh, but the north side above that diagonal cut is a private residence, and he uses that fenced area for his dogs. So that one little building you see there on the north side is a doghouse. That's pretty pretty lucky for those dogs. It's a great place to run. And I, I didn't go just to Missouri. The the one on the left here is uh is is in North Dakota. Um so I've I've taken you'll see other photos. I've got some from South Dakota as well as some from Wyoming. So I've hit all the decommissioned missile missile fields in some respects most because of since the the Missouri sites are obviously close, closer to me those are the ones I I have the opportunity to to shoot most of so the one on the right here is is really interesting I think uh hotel two is on prairie conservation land owned by uh the state of Missouri so it's 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 not owned by a private individual and anybody can go right out to it the fence is gone, but it's still pretty easy to, t- if you know where to look, you, you, it's, it's clear that it used to be a missile site. And even here, 
looking down, you can you can still see that ghost image of where that uh, rectangular fence line was. Another North, North Dakota on the left and South Dakota on the right. And then Missouri on the left and North Dakota on the right. So this one's interesting because this is a decommissioned Minuteman three missile site, um, but it is left intact. At least the top part of it is the under uh, underground is, is, has been eliminated, uh, but it is part of a state historic site uh, near Cooperstown, North Dakota. So you, if you if you make the trek up to North Dakota, you can. This is open to the public. Um, you, you can drive right up to it. You can see my car in the, on the uh, access drive just to the north. I'm standing just to the back of my car there, actually. Uh, so this is what most of these sites would have looked like uh, before they were decommissioned. Um, and I specifically wanted to go to this museum so I could see. This is the only site. Uh, it, um, there are two preserved missile sites um, that where you can go see the, the you know, the silo door and the components above ground that are still there. This is the only one you can fly your drone over um, because it's the, the other one in South Dakota is run by the National Park Service and it's against, it's a federal law. You can't fly your, a drone <laughs> in a national park. So this one's the only one I could fly above that had the above ground top side uh, components still intact written into the, the, the missile treaty to, to preserve it. So, so that Russia is okay with it too. Uh, the one on the left is in Rich Hill, Missouri, and then Prairie City, Missouri on the right. What was, um, what was Russia doing at the time we were making these missile sites? That's, I mean, that's a great question. Similar yes. idea. Yeah, right. So yeah, that was it. Russia was also um was also making nuclear weapons and and had uh ICBM missiles that that could reach us. Um so it was that that idea that you know I won't shoot you if you shoot me, you know. Um so yes, it was there was parody. Um, at some point during the Cold War, um, America had nuclear missiles pointed at Russia and Russia had nuclear missiles pointed at America. So can you get photos of decommissioned sites in Russia? Oh, man. You're, OK, so I was going to talk about that. You're getting ahead of me. I, uh, I would <laughs> love I'll spoil it. Not that I know of, but I would like to find out how, um, because that would be amazing. Um, and shortly before the Ukraine invasion, I was trying to figure out how I could get over there. Um, they have Cold War museums like we do, where you can go out to a rural part of Ukraine and see where there were Soviet, Russian Soviet um, missile silos. But not a great idea to go there now. So it's, um, that would be something I would love to do eventually. That's an interesting question, Chris, how similar they would look. Ukraine is what half of a giant piece of Kansas anyway. That's a good point. That's cool. Yeah. And as I as I understand it, um, Russia also had mobile uh, ICBM launchers, so um, which which America didn't have. America had hosted its nuclear ICBMs in, in the ground, like we see here, uh, in submarines and in and in bombers. Um, and Russia had that. But they also had, um, like, on the backs of trucks too. This is all one location in Garden City, Missouri. So I've got a photo on the left from 2019, uh, in the middle 2020, and then uh, that should actually see say 2022 on the right. Um, actually, have that photo here just to the back of me. Um, more to just to give you a sense of how how big I print these out. Um, I hope no one's watching this on a mobile phone. Thank you for joining. But it's it, it it's I I want I brought this uh, just to demonstrate that uh, the best way to view these, if possible, is in 
is in person and in and up up close so you can get to the big photo uh, because there's just so much detail in there that's uh, a lot of fun to to see for me um what we see on the right here is can anybody guess what that red white and blue thing is fourth of july party exactly right it's a it, well yeah it's a fourth of july um fireworks stand yeah yeah so that's what i thought when i when i when i learned that there was when they sold fireworks in, in this old nuclear missile um site that, that's like, amazing they sell some branded like minuteman or titan or atlas or there there was one there was a doomsday themed one and i bought it i should have i have a photograph i should put it in the presentation <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, a couple more, also the same site, Lima Six and Creighton, Missouri, just different times of the year. Uh, the one on the left here, uh, the, the, the landowner decided to shorten the fence line, uh, and then another from North Dakota on the right. Has there been any bad stuff leaking out of these missile silos? So that's a great question. Um, Yes, but not what you'd think. Um, so there is nothing like nothing radioactive, but there are, uh, I know for a fact that the state of Missouri Department of Conservation um, or Department of Natural Resources keeps tabs on all 150 of these and stays in touch with all their owners um, to help regulate um, some, to help regulate some of the stuff that's still left in the soil and it's things left over from these were built in the 60s so you know they use things like asbestos and lead paint and there's pcbs i think from the fuel um so that stuff is still a concern um for the state of missouri and so when you take ownership of one of these sites you 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 have to sign papers and you know assure that you know what you're doing there's some regular you can't build you can't dig 24 inches into the soil um but you could you can do it you can do other things you can obviously store bales there and on the photo on the right i'm not honestly sure what's going on here uh there's it was there was a um i took this and this was happening in real time there was a a tractor digging into some stored soil perhaps and putting it onto a, a dumper um so i tried to i tried to flag down the driver there but uh he he didn't want to talk to me just kept on driving uh yep drexel missouri on the left post oak missouri on the right leeton missouri on the left lamont missouri on the right Center View, Missouri, on the left. This was during a foggy, snowy morning, and I couldn't, I couldn't get my drone to stay up in the air because the uh, it was so cold and foggy that the propellers kept um, collecting ice, and so I kept getting all kinds of warning messages to land. But I did get this photo, uh, and this is this is the same site. Uh, so winter on the left, and. Um, and probably fall on the right. Um, so, so a moment ago when we were talking about uh, the the what's still left in the soil and how you can't dig 24 inches below the soil, this this church on the left is a good example of of that. So. Um, I talked to the landowner and to people, um, representatives of this building, this church um, in Kingsville, Missouri. Uh, this land was donated to the church, uh, and the church had to build just to the east of the of the actual missile site, so that it would avoid um, any potential contaminants that were in the soil. So they used the missile site itself for a parking lot for the church, and the access road to the north is still um is still the access road for the church today so the road that was originally for military vehicles to get to the site is now is now the the entrance to the parking lot which i think is super interesting 
Uh, and then the one on the right in Concordia, Missouri, there's a few of these that are just completely gone. And this is one of them. Um, not hide nor hair. I found the entrance to the access road from the, from the county road to the south of it. Um, but, you know, you can, you can look back at those Google images, Google satellite images, like we were looking at a little bit ago, and you can see where it existed. It's there, but then at some point in time, it just, it just disappears. And I need to get to the bottom of that, bottom of that. I'm not sure. Um, I'd be interested to know how they were able to do that. What's also interesting about that, that site though, um, that the county road to the south of it, to this day is called Minuteman Road. And you can go, you can drive that road and you can see the wayfinding signs on the, you know, the street signs that say Missile Man Road, but the, or Minuteman Road. Yeah, Minuteman Road. And, but the missile is gone. So I think that's super great, super interesting. Chillowee, Missouri on the left. And then in another North Dakota, another one of those that's completely gone on the right. Uh, Echo 7, Sedalia, Missouri on the left. It's another, it's more public land. Um, so it, anybody can just, you know, drive right on out there, drive right into the, the middle of that property if they want to. Um, the fence, so there's a couple interesting things about this one. This would, this a prescribed burn had just happened recently. So the, the land was just all blackened, which, which was really interesting, I thought. Um, and it looks like that the that the poles, um, the fence has all been pulled up around the the perimeter, and you can see just a little bit of you can see along the left side on the west the the west fence line there are holes still there, um, just by virtue of where the sun was hitting it. If walking right up above it, I wouldn't walking up to those holes. I I didn't see them, but my drone was able to like spot that. And then another one on, that, that says North Dakota on the right, but I have that one wrong. That's another uh, Missouri one. My fault on the wrong label. North Dakota on the left, Higginsville, Missouri on the right. Uh, and then these are interesting. These are, these are around Chugwater, Wyoming. Uh, these were Minuteman silos originally, and then they became MX missile silos in the 80s. And they were decommissioned more recently um, in the early 2000s. And this was just a fantastic, um, mm -hmm. partly cloudy day. So a lot of kind of light and shadow effects, thanks to the clouds. And these are interesting because for whatever reason, di they're different from Missouri in their decommissioning. Um, they leave some topside components intact. So you can still see where there was um, a, where the missile silo cap would have been. Um, all sealed up now, of course, but for whatever reason, that's, that's part of the, the way those were designed to be decommissioned. And so- at some, point, at some point, someone thought it was best to whatever, hide those missiles in the ground or get them down there. But today, where are the missiles? I mean, of the newer missiles. So Where yeah, but as as far as I understand, the newer missiles, the next generation of ICBMs, will be around FE Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming, um, which which is actually where these are. This these would have been these MX missiles were um, would have been under the command of of that of that Air Force Base, and so that's where I understand that they're prepping now for the Sentinel missiles to go. Most of my work is this, is the bread and butter of, of this uh, photo essay are these top down um, photos. Uh, but I also have, I call, I think of them as supporting images that are kind of like these three quarter views that just kind of give a little bit more idea of the landscape. Um, so this one, so this one here would have been the the one on the left, Quebec Seven. And then a close up of that silo cap. Uh, this one's at a nearby Quebec Four in the same area.
This is a three quarter view of one we saw just a moment ago in Missouri. Another Missouri. Another Missouri site uh, that we saw a moment ago. Uh, the site itself was where the grain bins were. Um, and then the access road, the original access road kind of comes in and turns into a road that then goes off to that. Uh, it must, I think it's like a pig barn or something. Uh, another one near Chiloe, Missouri. It's just a, a fence that's been shortened. Interesting because you can still see just on the north side, just a slight ghost of image of where that uh, top or the, the fence used to be. And then for whatever reason, the rest of the fence is on the south side. They're kind of obscured in the dark. This one's not far off of I-70 in Missouri. And this was on a nice foggy morning near Prairie City, Missouri. This was that, this was the doghouse site. So on the south side, the farm with the curved drive, the curved access road. And then on the and then on, on the right side of the photo, the north side of the site has the doghouse. Just stunning to me because it's just <laughs> two was totally different. Uh, ways to, to keep that property. And hay bales are probably the most typical use for these sites today. This is the uh, prairie conservation area uh, that we saw a few moments ago, just to give you an idea of kind of the surrounding land. Another MX uh, site Chugwater, Wyoming. Another Missouri. This one's in Rich Hill, Missouri. Green Ridge, Missouri. This is that church I was talking a moment ago, Kingsville, Missouri. And then I also, you know, get down on the ground and, and just use my, you know, my, my uh, digital um, camera for, for shots like this. This one's in South Dakota, back in Missouri. This one still has one of the original signs on it, which just blows me away. Mo most details like that are long gone, but, uh, but this one still had it. And I left it there. I was tempted to take it, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I would have not been invited back. This, this owner was so nice. Uh, Mike 11 in uh, Centerview, Missouri. This is one of the first ones I ever took. Very overgrown, which I love. Uh, and then I have uh, a newer phase of this project is, is talking to and photographing the owners. Um, just the idea of, of how the intertwined, um, the idea of how intertwined the histories of, of these bits of land and the owners I, I, is fascinating to me. You know, either this is a younger guy, you know, so this has been, um, th this was a land his family bought, um, not necessarily so somebody who grew up in the area, um, but just was, you know, part of their, their family farming plan. Um, and this is the site from the air. So everything here is sitting right around the outside uh, fence line. Um, so again, you know, where I talked about, you know, not being able to dig two feet into the soil. I think they're avoiding all of that, but they're, you know, they're going right, right around the edges with their, uh, with their bins and their buildings, which is just fascinating. This is an interesting guy I met Christian. Yeah, he was running the fireworks stand at that uh, at the the one that I showed you with the uh, red, white, and blue tent. And here it is, just right off the Missouri Highway. Interesting to me too, because you know at the time that these would have been active, you could have driven your car right past, you know, and either maybe you knew what it was or maybe you didn't, but there it was. 
So not not all that hidden all the time. Uh, this is a co-owner of this site, Tom, um, and he was a great great guy to talk to. Um, currently, the site is a quail part of a quail preserve outside of Garden City, Missouri. So that's what he was. He had bales here too. I think he had a um, an area farmer who was you know renting this land for so he could put bales there, but also this and the surrounding land were part of a, 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 a quail preserve. This is that site from the air. Uh, and then Oscar 10, the site um, a moment ago that we talked about that for the earth moving company, this is the owner of that site. Uh, and he was showing me, he still has the original marker sign um, back when this was still active. He kind of had it out back. It was kind of on the junk pile. I was, I made sure, you know, to let him know that you gotta, you gotta put that somewhere. You know, that's that's an important piece of history you got there, which I think he agrees. Um, but a lot of these guys are just so practical, you know, in in the way that they um, run their businesses or or run their land. Great guy to talk to. And this is that uh, that site again, kind of at a three quarter view. Almost done with the photos. The last few I'll, I'm going to show you are are these. This is this is a Nike missile site, so it's not a it's not a an ICBM. This was like an, an a ground to air nuclear missile silo. So that so a Nike so Nike missiles in the 50s and 60s, I think maybe the 70s too, were 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 positioned around larger cities. Kansas City had four of these, so that they were kind of the last line of defense for any Soviet bombers that would have gotten that far into, um, you know, attacking this country. So these were kept in the ground. Um, this is the owner looking at the, the bay doors uh, for those where the missiles would have been. He's, his back is faced to the camera because he wished to remain anonymous, which was, you know, of course, fine by me. I was just happy to be there. Glad he, Glad he let me in. And this was right at sunset. So I just love how overgrown this all looks. I love the overgrowth because it's sort of like, it's a visual reminder of just how long this has not been a nuclear weapon. This is a, uh, a stairwell going down. This, you can see the water line there. For whatever reason, the water table is not that high, but the water line is where it is here because it's been collecting the water. It rains and just collects and it's just like this giant cistern. So um, ac accessing that underside of this, of this missile bunker is not possible unless you are a scuba diver. Interesting though, that that wasn't collapsed like, like everything else was. Uh, yeah, that's, I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah. It's uh Oh yes. Yeah. So, okay. So right. This would so. Yeah. This is not collapsed. This is this would have not been imploded. Um, Nike missile sites were not decommissioned, or at least they were not destroyed by like a, a missile treaty the way Minuteman sites were. Um, this would have all. This would have all been um, open. You know, once it was sold back to the private landowners. Similar to, yeah, you could have walked in. Yeah. Atlas missile sites are like that to this day, like the, the ones from the late 50s, early 60s. Those were, those were never destroyed. Uh, they were decommissioned, uh, but sometimes you'll see people who are like interest, like preppers or people who have YouTube channels uh, or Airbnbs, you know, uh, filming themselves inside of those, um, you know because they can, but not, but not Minuteman sites. Yeah, because those were all destroyed underneath. Um, has, there been, has there been a person or persons that has made a home out of a missile silo? Same yeah. I saw happening on that, like in North Dakota? In North Dakota. 
it, it could it could be um the the ones i've heard about the, the maybe the most famous one was in kansas about 20 or 25 years ago there was a guy around topeka who had an atlas f atlas e style so it was a little bit different it was kind of the it, the the missile wasn't vertically in the ground it was horizontally stored in the ground uh and he and he famously made that into a home for his wife him and his wife or maybe he had a family um and so he kind of he was sort of the poster child for a while like in the uh, i don't know online world of nuclear missile buffs you know he he was he i don't think he lives there anymore uh but he he was kind of you that was the the guy you would always see if you like you did a google search for nuclear missile site homes that would come up invariably in wilson kansas there's a guy who has an airbnb um camping an rv experience above ground uh but he'll take you down into his atlas sites as part of the the the, the experience if you want to radioactive spiders in there or something yeah i don't know yeah I mean, <laughs> i'd be more concerned about the maybe the old lead paint but i don't know it's you know it was interesting i went i went down in there and it was uh it was really interesting uh and then this is that nike missile site from the air huge and just and so overgrown very fascinating. Okay, so so that's you, we've made it through the work. So you've seen you've seen what I've done. I'll take you a little bit through the process now, and then we'll wrap it up, and we'll have some, a Q and A here pretty soon. Um, by far and away, my favorite part of this whole process is the the traveling. Arriving at one of these uh, sites for me is better than than Christmas as a kid. Uh, but I'll explain a little bit how I get there. So the, so the, the Russians, Soviets have always known where these sites are. Um, so it's no secret today either. Um, in fact, if you just go to Wikipedia, like I do, it's very easy to find and locate each of these. Um, so the page we're looking at here is the Wikipedia page for um, the, the missile sites around Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. Um, and the, the big black arrow is pointed to, to Delta IV. So I'm just gonna take you through kind of how I, I go about this. Um, so pretend like you're online, we're gonna click on that blue link and it'll take you to a Google map. And so you get an idea right away of kind of like what you might expect to see. Uh, and this is really like the inspiration for me, like getting the drone and going out to these sites and shooting these. Because initially in this process, I, I, I was hoping to find satellite imagery that was high res enough for me to make print out big photos. Um, and this, and it's just that technology is not there yet, or at least it's not available to, to me, or at least to my budget. Um, so Google Maps will only get you so far uh, in terms of seeing this stuff. So going there with a drone, you know, really was the answer for me uh, in, in, take, in making these photographs. The next thing I do is uh, I run it through an app called OnX, which, uh, help, which will give me public information on who owns that location. And then uh and then you know a lot of these sites are right on are, are available to see on google street view so again something online tools that are super helpful just to kind of like even if you don't go to these sites in person it's it's pretty fun to just kind of go down a rabbit hole and and see where see where these are so this is delta four so the day i went here uh i i go and i knock on the door like i do uh and uh and so and i met this guy randy he's the owner of delta four and what he's holding in his hand there is a letter from the missouri department of natural resources and that's that's that government agency i was telling you before 
about that keeps tabs on all 150 sites in Missouri. Um, and just and they you know they stay in in contact with each of the owners. So that's that letter is correspondence from the the DNR. Uh, generally, I find that the owners are happy to talk to me because they can see I'm excited about what they have. You know, it's a, it's a piece of history. They usually agree with me on that. Um, I've been told to go away a couple times, which is fine. Um, but that doesn't happen very often. Um, and then, you know, getting to talk to the owners, that's, I get to, uh, if they're comfortable with it, I'll, I'll get to photograph them. Um, and then I get to shoot their site. So this is Randy's farm, a three quarter view. So you can see my little car pulled up to the gate there on the far right side. Here's another view of it. He had quite the collection of things, which I thought was super interesting. And here is a, I've got, a, I'm not a videographer, but I have a couple video here's videos here to show you. So we get the drone in the air. We go down the access. Look for the blue sign that says D4 just to the left of the gate. That's very lucky that that's there. He keeps his lot pretty secure, though. He's got a, fe a fence, a yeah, security fence around his security fence. Okay, so there's one. And then here's the next one. Once the drone is over the site, Then we go up to 400 feet, which is what the FAA allows, which is just about perfect to frame up the shot. And you kind of you kind of get the idea. and take some shots and then eventually get to the final product here. So Delta four in Clarksburg, Missouri. So that's kind of, that's, that's a quick overview of uh, how I find these shots. So we'll talk a little bit about the global peace photo award. So in 2021, uh, once I was well underway with this project, uh, traveling out to Missouri, you know, had I already made up a, a trip up to the Dakotas. Um, I was actively looking for funding uh, so I could sort of level up my efforts. So I applied to, I applied for several individual artist grants and entered some more photo contests and was rejected for all of them, except for one. It was the Global Peace Photo Award, which I thought at least sounded like it was in my wheelhouse. Uh, but the but the one hitch was that uh, the award ceremony was in Austria. So they let you know that if you won, you know, they expected you to travel. So I was like, well, I don't know about that. You know, pandemic, I'm probably not going to win. So I'll just enter it anyway. I think it was even free to enter. Uh, so a little bit about the Global Peace Photo Award. Um, it recognizes and promotes photographers from all over the world whose pictures capture human efforts toward a peaceful world and the quest for beauty and goodness in our lives. Uh, the award goes to those phot photographers that best express the idea that our future lies in peaceful coexistence. Um, so it's, it's organized by um, a publishing group in, out of Vienna called Edition Lammenhuber, but they also have uh, partners such as UNESCO, Austrian Parliament, the World Press Photo Foundation, among other organizations. Um, and every year it's like, it's over, this year in particular is over 16,000 images from 114 countries. And surprisingly, luckily I, I made the short list, which meant I was like one of 25 or so photographers. And then a short time later, I was told to make travel plans to Vienna, which meant, <laughs> that I was at least, I was one of five finalists um, or medalists. Um, so here I am. I, I traveled during the pandemic of 2021, which was nuts. Um, but here, here I am in the museum district of Vienna. 
Um, and a medal is what I got. The, uh, there was also a grand prize of 10,000 euros, but that was, that was for somebody else, which was fine. Um, my travel and hotel were paid for. I was fed well. Uh, and this is, here's me standing on stage a little out of place, uh, but nonetheless, happy to be there. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, no, we, we had a, we had a technical glitch and your face was on your face. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So here I am standing awkwardly receiving my award. So, uh, so this is really where, um, so I, I think the, the biggest lesson I've, I've learned, you know, in this, in this journey, um, was, was here on this stage at this moment, you know, I was at this moment, I was rolling with people whose day jobs it was to make the world a better place. I met people from NGOs who go to war zones to bring aid to people. I met a Russian journalist editor who fled Russia to keep her job and her life. I met a National Geographic photographer who was the first to photograph the, the elephant's foot within the, the bowels of Chernobyl. Uh, I met another medalist who earned the trust and made portraits of victims of Boko Haram in Nigeria. And then, and so this is, this was when it, you know, it kind of hit me like, uh, and, and so if I have a lesson to pass on, uh, it's here where I learned it. And that's how to take what I was doing with my photography um, and apply it to a cause greater than myself to, to help elevate that cause. Um, you know, uh, it, it helps to highlight that cause and then d demonstrate why it's important. And, and for me, like I said earlier, it's about uh, nuclear weapon nonproliferation. Um, it's, you know, there's always a part of this work that'll be a little bit autobiographical and that's fine. Um, but really it, it's, uh, you know, being able to like ladder up this effort to, to, to uh, something bigger and better is, is kind of I, what I think has worked for me. Uh, of course, no one creates in a vacuum. Um, you know, uh, uh, once I did find my territory, you know, I learned everything I, I could about it, about it. Uh, who else has done work similar to mine and how then I can differentiate the work I'm doing from, from others. Um, and, and I'm kind of lucky that no one else is really doing exactly what I'm doing. Uh, but there's plenty of other work that informs what I do and helps teach me. Um, like the artist photographer, uh, Terry Evans, who has done a lot of aerial photography of the Kansas Prairie and Flint Hills. Uh, her work is, is, is like a North star for me on how to capture the ground from, from above. Um, actually, uh, go talk with, with Sam Jack and see if, if any of these books are available at Newton Public Library. Um, actually, I know some of them are because I, the ones with green dots uh, are available. Um, and there's, there's others too that I don't even have here. Um, so I don't know if you can tell that I am married to a librarian. So it's, uh, you know, I, I try to, I, and the first photo exhibit, exhibits I did in Kansas City were in library galleries um, where I got to collaborate with the librarians to pull books uh, from the shelves to put into a library display to help both promote the exhibit and promote the books. Um, you know, histories of the Cold War, Cuban Missile Crisis, Reagan in the 80s, et cetera. Uh, and then one more important source uh, is the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, whose doomsday clock uh, has been a reminder to the public since 1947, when it was set at seven minutes to midnight. Uh, annually, the Bulletin moves the hands of the clock either closer or further from midnight, according to its assessment of nuclear global catastrophe. Uh, and it was it was actually today they 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 did their their 2003 announced. 2023 announcement. Um, here you see on the screen, it says 100 seconds to midnight. That was set in 2022. In 2023, just today, it was announced that it's 90 seconds to midnight. So the closer to the idea being the closer it is to midnight, the closer it is we are to doomsday. Um, 
So, and up to the last few years, that that assessment's always been based on nuclear danger. But recently, it's it's the the bulletin has included uh, climate change and misinformation to its assessment. So, force multipliers in an already dangerous nuclear geopolitical climate. Uh, and so what's next? So somebody asked about going to see the equivalent uh, silos in mm -hmm. uh, in the Soviet Union. And that is that's the dream. I, I don't have any plans to do it right now. Um, my wife is really relieved to know that. But uh, that would be the, the long term goal uh, to be able to put those side by side, you know, decommission nuclear missile silos in America next to this, the equivalent in, in Ukraine or, or Russia. Uh, finding, if you're interested in this work or what would like interest in following this work, it's easy to do. Um, I have, it's either natehofer.com uh, or you could, or you can find me on, um, on Instagram, which is I'm at Nate Hofer. So this is about the end, you know, important to say um, my thank yous. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, came into play uh, between last fall and then today to make this happen. So big thanks to Marion Eichelberger, Sam Jack, of course. And then uh, though you both are key to for this talk today, uh, as well as other people seen here, uh, getting me to Newton back in September. So that's, that's the presentation. Uh, now I, I could talk about this stuff all day long. So if anybody has any questions, I am more than willing to chat. Thank you. And we did have one um, from Re Rebecca that came in a while ago. Um, these are both purposeful and beautiful photos. Does that pose some type of contradiction for you? Ah, that's a great question. Let's just go back and take a look. Uh, yeah, I didn't talk about that, but that's that's a good observation. Um, I think at the, I'm gonna have to do it like this. I think at the end of the day, these have to be beautiful. These have to be beautiful photographs. Um, sorry, let me get this back on. You know. Uh, if these don't work as beautiful photographs, then they don't work at all. Um, I think there's a strong concept and a framework that I'm working within. Uh, and so I, I, there is a, I have a fantastic balance. I think, I, I think that these are not hard to shoot and there is a, a natural beauty in each of these on their own. Um, and I, I don't know if I'm answering the question. Is it a contradiction? Yeah, it is a contradiction. I think that's that's part of its strength. You know, it's 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 when you follow this through to its logical logical conclusion. You know, nuclear weapons, it can get pretty scary and dark. Um, and at the same time, I love looking at these photographs. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, any any more questions? Those of you online, you can type. A question: Do you have one for Nate, or um, if you'd like, I can turn your microphone on and just just say in the chat you'd like me to do that, and I'll turn your microphone on. And then also here in the room, any more questions? Any questions for Nate? More questions? How easily do you think you would uh, be able to have the information for Russia in case you wanted to do this over there? You think that would be difficult information, or I I think it'll be not as easy to get, but I've already seen information online about it there are i haven't found a wikipedia page that has the same information but i have found uh people online who do things like urban exploring uh who who kind of just know where this stuff is um and i and i've seen there's there used to be at least a museum in ukraine that was um that was a cold war museum that had um decommissioned nuclear weapons and had a decommissioned nuclear missile silo so i the plan would probably be to start there um but if i was planning a trip say in a year to go shoot that stuff i would yeah i would need some time to kind of to pull that information together make some contacts and 
make sure it was a safe journey all the way around to be able to do something like that. Yeah, it would be harder. I guess that's the question. Yeah, it would be. Um, but I look forward to it. Hopefully I get to do that. Was there a time when you when you realized that this was going to work, that you were going to get such a, a good variety and, and such um, attractive photos? Yeah, there was. It was this one here on the left, Mike 11 and Center View, Missouri. Um, yeah, there was I there was. There's a couple steps to get to this this first successful one. I thought um, I, I had I knew somebody at work had a drone. I asked him if he'd be willing to go with me to a site to find to just to shoot it, just to see what would happen, just to see like to eat, to, I don't I didn't know if you could get up high enough to even fit it into the frame. Um, just practical knowledge like that. Uh, and once I once it was clear, like okay, it is it could work. Um, then I bought my own drone. And then this, this one on the, the green one on the left that that morning when I took that, um, it was, I was just so over the moon. Um, when I came home and looked at those, I was sending my wife, um, quick snippets, quick shots, quick proofs of them, you know, while she was at work, I had the day off and she was, I think she was working. Uh, and yeah, I, I just, I couldn't believe like, almost how how accessible it was it's like this this can work um yeah that's a good question because a, there was there was a leap kind of a ramping up to this where i was kind of vetting this idea with friends of mine or people artists that i knew um my uncle uh bob regeer was one of them just like hey what do you think of if this was to happen what if as i describe it what do you think and uh or i would show them some you know maps off Google or something. Um, yeah. And, uh, and that, that all kind of led to this moment here, uh, when finally I thought, okay, I, I did one and it worked. <laughs> I don't see, um, at least I can't tell, but I don't, I haven't noticed any animals on these sites. Maybe they are, but then it looks like, uh, I don't know. I'd be kind of hesitant to live on that ground with that, with that deep, Contamination. Yeah. Contamination. Yeah. Available. Yeah. 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 That's a that's a good point. Um, I've only seen one or two sites where I think that there, there might be a home actually on the site, but those are edge cases. Most of these, you know, it it would be tough to live there because I imagine you'd have to dig dig your utilities um, and get that stuff in place. So it's, yeah, I agree with you. I feel the way you do. I don't know how I would feel long-term about living someplace, living, living on one of these, but, um, and I think you mentioned animals. Yeah. Yeah. There, uh, that's, that's an interesting one too. Uh, it, cause it, it, it occurs to me that, you know, there is a lot of wildlife. I mean, that's, it's, it's very natural um you know the overgrowth or whatever happens to be growing there um i haven't run into any any animals on on any of these sites yet i hope to but it either i i assume i scare them off by the time i get there also you don't want your dog digging too deep <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a good point <laughs> Yeah, I guess I you wouldn't want to. I wonder. I guess they collapsed it in so they wouldn't. That there wouldn't be a sinkhole or something open up. That would be. That's true. Right. No. That all that's shored up. Um, I've never seen any 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 kind of sinkhole. Yeah. Well, um, I think uh, I think we're good. Um, I don't see any more questions pending. Oh wait. Oh, there's must have been on Facebook. Whitney says, "I love how these also work as." Abstract images, but then more information is revealed upon closer inspection. Ah, thank you, Whitney. That's true. That's yeah. I, I didn't get into the more of the formal uh, principles, I guess, or the visual principles uh, of of these. But that's yeah. That's that's true. I think kind of um, I, that's a whole other layer to unpack right there. Actually, is is uh, I think. Some of these um, you might not even know 
that there there's any kind of like natural topology like you might not even that might not even look like a landscape it just might look like an abstract painting um and i love that aspect about this too yes we should say congratulations on your work and your award very nice yeah thank you yeah, I, I, yeah. I thank you i appreciate that a lot this has been a lot of fun for me like i say i could I could talk to him blue in the face about this stuff. So it's just, it's, uh, it's such an honor to, to get to talk to you all. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you again so much. And um, we'd love to have you back sometime. Um, if next, when your next photo project is, is ready to show off or if you've got- From Russia. From Russia or whatever. You got it. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you again. And I'll sign us off of the Zoom now. So bye-bye. All right. Bye -bye. All right. Thanks, Sam. Thanks all. Good night.